here to share my okay got it okay so uh milky way photography now uh what got me started was in june 2010 so it's about 13 years ago a friend took me out to a place east of calgary and he showed me how to take pictures and i was using my canon 5d mark ii and i set it to iso 6400 f 248 and i got this picture and i was quite excited because the first time i got a photograph of the milky way anyway five years later i reprocessed the same raw file and the milky way looks more prominent so processing is very important when you take pictures of the milky way now what is the milky way now if you can get out of space and you look down on the milky way this is what the milky way would look like now uh, right here is our sun so our sun is sorry just... sorry tony um your yeah. your display is not changing oh my display not changing so all you we can see is your uh, introductory my... screen ha huh. okay so let me let me get out of the the share and then i will share again now uh share screen and go to powerpoint now can you see there we go my... we can barely hear you though you can barely hear me but my my volume is turned on oh. on high so can you hear me okay now no, we, I, we can't I, hear you, Tony. Huh. I'm just wondering. Maybe something's wrong with my microphone. Maybe maybe there's something wrong with my microphone. How how is my voice right now? Uh very, very quiet. Huh. So hmm. Uh let me see. Let me see if I can borrow a microphone from somewhere. Uh, uh, yeah, but be my headphone, the microphone one. There we go. Okay, now I, I I'm puzzled because our. Our sound was working minutes ago, unless I have a bad connection here. Ah, hmm. uh, okay. Now I'm trying to borrow a headset from my from my son. Uh, okay, maybe let me. Huh. Okay, just just a minute. Sorry, folks, please bear with us. Technical difficulties, as you can see. Microphone, the check. I don't know if that's a little. Okay. okay. Uh, one is headphone and one's microphone. Oh, come on, make your input over there. Okay. You okay. 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 now is it working now? Hear him really good, please. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, 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 we can. Thank you. 
Okay, okay, can you hear you? So if you can hear me, then we can continue our meeting. Sorry about the, the microphone thing. Okay, so now you can see my picture of the Milky Way and uh, the this, this dot is the location of our sun. So relatively re relative to the entire Milky Way. Okay, now, uh, I saw on the web, they say that on any given night, all we can see is within this little red circle. We cannot see the details of this entire Milky Way. So, but anyway, now this is the side view of our Milky Way. So if you go from one side to the other, it is about 100,000 light years wide in diameter. And then in the center of the Milky Way, we have a bulge. And this bulge has billions and billions of stars. So our sun's location is roughly 28,000 light years from the center. So we all know that a light year is how how long it takes for light to travel during one year. So we're talking about tremendous, tremendous uh, far distance. Okay, and the Milky Way is roughly 1,000 light years thick. So this is way beyond everyone's comprehension. But this is what the Milky Way looks like. Now. I am going to go to the next slide. Can you see my next slide now? Yep. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, um, the the universe consists of billions of Milky Ways, and our Milky Way is only one of billions of little dots in the universe. So we we are really really small in the entire universe. So I'm going to go to the next one. So here is a complete view of the Milky Way. And this photo was taken by some astronomers. So uh, in the center is the bulge. This is, this is the center of our galaxy. And the sun is located somewhere near the edge, okay? But we, we live on Earth and the Earth rotates around the sun. And the sun rotates in part of the Milky Way. So on any given day, as long as the sky is clear, we should be able to see the Milky Way because we are all surrounded by the Milky Way. So the Milky Way is always there. As long as the sky is dark, mm -hmm. then we should be able to see it and take photos of it. But if it is too bright with a full moon, then it would, it would be difficult for us to see the Milky Way. All right? Now, um, now if we are looking at the side view of the Milky Way, it, the, rep, the Milky Way would be represented by this horizontal line. And the Milky Way core will be in the middle here, okay? However, our sun is located near the edge of the Milky Way. And the, the nine planets that circles around the sun the plane of the solar system is tilted at a very high angle, 63 degrees. So these created some interesting things when we try to observe the Milky Way. Now, I will try to do my best to explain this picture. Now, remember, this is our Milky Way. You are looking down from the top. This is a planned view of the Milky Way. And, oops, and
and our sun is located here. And remember, our Earth circles around the sun. Now, when you look at this photo on here, on this side, is the summer, our summer, and on this side will be our winter, and the Earth circles around the sun. So when we are in the summertime at night, you see here is a map of the of the world. And the US is here and Canada is right here. So in the summer oh okay, another thing is our earth axis is tilted. So our earth does not rotate in a perpendicular axis, but our axis of rotation is tilted at an angle, okay? So now going back to this earth now, this is, this is the US and this is Canada, and North Pole is about here. Now, we cannot see the Milky Way during the day because the sun was too bright so we can only see it at night so now in the summertime at night in southern part of canada we are in darkness here and when it gets dark when we look this way towards the milky way we see the milky way and the milky way core Okay, now when it comes to the winter time, because our Earth axis is tilted, in the winter time, when it gets dark on this side, we are facing away from the Milky Way. In the winter time, our when it gets dark, Canada is facing the edge of the Milky Way. Look, look at look at this again. Now, in the summertime, when the Earth is on this side of the, Earth, the the sun, you see the red dot is the sun. In the summertime, when we when the Earth is located where my pointer is, and when we are opposite to the sun, that means in in darkness, then we are facing the core of the Milky Way. So we'll be able to see the Milky Way very well. But in the winter time, when the Earth is on this side of the sun, at night, when we are opposite to the sun at night, we will be looking at the edge of the Milky Way. There are not a lot of stars on this side of the Milky Way. So, this explains the difference between the summer Milky Way and the winter Milky Way. Uh, do you understand what I'm saying? If you have questions, please ask me and I will try my best to answer. All right? If no one has any questions, I will continue. All right? I think we're, we're good for now, Tony. Good, good. Okay, now, um, okay, I was saying that, no, let me go back. Now, in the, in the summertime, we, we will be able to see the Milky Way and its core. But remember where Canada is. Canada is located right here on the upper part of the Northern Hemisphere. If we want a good view of the Milky Way core or the entire Milky Way, we cannot see the entire Milky Way because if we look in this direction, the Earth is in the way. So all we can see from this point is going this way. We can barely see the Milky Way core and we get to see this part of the Milky Way. However, for those people 
living in the southern hemisphere, such as South America, Australia, or New Zealand, because they are located here. So they have an unobstructed view of the entire Milky Way. Okay, so I will move to the next slide. Now, this is a photo taken in Milford Sound, New Zealand. As you can see, this part is the Milky Way core. This part has the maximum number of stars. And as we move towards this side and this side, we are approaching the edge of the Milky Way. So we people in the Southern Hemisphere, they can always see this beautiful view of the Milky Way. Now, when we see the Milky Way, a very prominent feature would be this dark color band like this, going the full length of the Milky Way. What is this dark color band? This color band represents gigantic clouds of dust. Yes, we are talking about dust, dust particles, just like what we see on Earth. Dust particles fill the universe. And if we do not have these giant dust clouds of particles, in our Milky Way, we will see a perfectly bright Milky Way, all, all filling in this Milky Way area. Unfortunately, the universe is full of dust. These dust clouds is blocking the light coming out of the Milky Way. You just imagine if we do not have these dark dust clouds, all this entire Milky Way will be bright uh, light, just shining as bright as the moon, but in the shape of a Milky Way. So uh, remember when we photograph the Milky Way, we are photographing three to four billion stars clustered together. Now remember, each star is one sun. So we are looking at three to four billion suns shining to, together. So it's very, very bright. But with the cosmic dust clouds, it is uh, blocking some of the lights coming out from the Milky Way. Okay, I'll move on. Now, this is the Milky Way in October, it, uh, taken in Cypress Hills area. Now, when we take pictures of the Milky Way, the Milky Way would appear differently every month because the, the our Earth is constantly moving, and because the Earth is rotating, so every time when you look up at the Milky Way, it looks different, okay? Now, uh, this is a photo of the Milky Way in June. Remember, I was saying earlier that in June, we will be able to see the core of the Milky Way. So this photo was taken in Kananaskis. You probably remember this is Mount Kit and this is uh, Wedge Mountain. But anyway, this is the Milky Way and this is the, <coughs> this is the Milky Way core or part of it. But you can see that the Milky Way core is shining very brightly. But of course, with some of the cosmic dust blocking the light from the Milky Way. So we cannot see 
the brightest part of the Milky Way right here. Excuse me, I just have to take a drink. Okay, now, when we see the Milky Way, we must learn to identify three stars. And when you learn how to identify these three stars, that will help you take photographs of the Milky Way. The number one star that you need to learn is this one. It is the brightest star in the sky in the summer. And the star is called Vega, V-E-G-A. The brightest star in the sky in the summertime. And then when you see Vega, you look across the Milky Way. On the other side of the Milky Way is the second brightest star in that area. And this star is called Altair. Now, the Chinese have a, a interesting legend about these two stars. They believe that Vega represents a female fairy that came from heaven to earth. And then Altair was a cowboy looking after his cows. But somehow yeah, the, the female fairy from heaven fell in love with this cowboy and they bear two children. But then when the gods learn about it, they took this fairy back to heaven. So the cowboy was left on earth, but he is constantly watching for his wife. So in front of him is one bright star. This star is believed to be the cowboy's son. And then there's a, a bright star behind him. And this is believed to be the cowboy's daughter. So the cowboy, the, the, his, his son and his, oh, sorry. The, the cowboy with his son and daughter, the three of them form a straight line and they aim across the Milky Way pointing at Vega. So these are the two stars that you must learn how to identify next time you go out. But there is a third star right in the middle of the Milky Way. And Vega, Altair, and Dunyab, they form the summer triangle. Even when you are in a heavily light polluted area, when you look up at the sky, you can always see the summer triangle. These three stars forming a triangle in the sky. Now, here is a picture taken in Crater Lake in Oregon in June. Now, remember, Crater Lake is uh, further south from Canada. So when we look at the Milky Way, we can see almost the complete core of the Milky Way right here. And you can see the fine details of some of these cosmic clouds and dust, okay? So this is what the Milky Way looked like in June. Now, this was taken near uh, Saskatchewan, and this was taken in May. So the Milky Way in May was almost horizontal above the horizon. I was lucky enough to catch some of the aurora. Now here is a picture of the Milky Way taken in Banff in August. Now you probably realize that the Milky Way is almost perpendicular to the horizon because we are in a different month. Uh, let's go back one slide. Look at this, the Milky Way is horizontal, almost horizontal. Now, remember the three stars that I was telling you about? The brightest star, Vega, and the cowboy across the Milky Way, Altair. 
And then here is a star that is called Dunup. And remember the summer triangle. Vega, Altair, and Dunup forming the triangle. Okay, now here is the Milky Way again, but you can probably identify it by now. So this is the brightest star, and this is Vega. And this is her husband, the cowboy, on the other side of the Milky Way. And I believe this is Dunup. So these three stars forming the summer triangle again. Now here is Milky Way in winter. Photo was taken in Banff in December. And this is the Milky Way because we are looking at the edge of the Milky Way away from the Milky Way core. So we don't see a lot of stars. Where is the core of the Milky Way? Way, way below the horizon, okay? So we cannot see the Milky Way core in the winter time. Now, how to take Milky Way photos? Well, first, you must have the right equipment. Then you should know when to go. You should know where to go. And you should know how to process the photos after you've taken them. The right equipment. You must have a digital camera. Because if you are using film, uh, it is a totally different ball game. The, the old film, the highest ISO that you would get is about six, ISO 1600, which is not high enough. With today's digital camera, we are usually using ISO 6400 or higher. Okay, You must have a good, sturdy tripod to support your camera. You should use wide-angle lens. 21 millimeter, 16 millimeter. Now, with the advancement of technology, manufacturers are making wider and wider wide angle lenses. Nowadays, you can buy 14 millimeter, 12 millimeter lenses. Even better yet, you should buy a fish eye lens if you want to take good pictures of the Milky Way. Now, you should also have a good shutter release cable. And then you should have a red LED light. Now, I found this on the web. And this is the standard equipment for any astrophotographer. You should have a tripod, digital camera with a wide angle lens, and you should have your headlamp because it, when you are in the dark, you want to be able to see some of the controls on your camera. Now, a good lens for Milky Way photography would be a fish eye lens. If you are using a micro four thirds camera, or something that is not a full frame. Then you can buy a Samyang, and this lens is relatively cheap. And then, but if you are using a full frame camera, like the Sony or Canon or Nikon, you can always buy a Samyang 12 millimeter full frame fish eye lens. Now, when you buy fish eye lens, it is very, very important that you buy the full frame fish islands because full frame would give you a full frame 35 millimeter picture area. Whereas if you buy something that is not a full frame, like micro four thirds lens, when you try to put this lens on your full frame camera, you will get a circle inside your picture area. You don't see the full frame picture area. So 
very important when you buy a fish islands, you must look for these words that says full frame fish eye. All right. Now, this is the best lens I've been using. Now, I have four fish eye lenses and I have two of this. To me, this is the best lens that money can buy if you're buying a fish eye lens. We all know how good Kao Zeiss is. And if you have to buy this brand new, you'll be looking at over $3,000. But you can buy an old Roly Kao Zeiss lens and then buy an adapter ring so that you can use this lens on uh, Nikon or Canon or Sony or any other cameras because this lens is tiny. It is very, very small comparing to the Samyang. The Samyang lens is much bigger than this Roly lens. And um, right now, you're, you'll be lucky if you if you can find a lens under $1,000. I have seen it as high as even 2000 Now, Roly, the company went bankrupt, but Kao Zeiss made many lenses for Roly. So uh, a lens like this was probably made in the 1970s or 1980s. The company went bankrupt in the mid 80s, mid 1980s. So you are buying an old used lens, but let me tell you, this lens is probably of the highest standard in terms of fish eye lenses. Okay, when you have your equipment, you should know how to use your equipment. You must know how to use all the menu controls. Menu everything. Menu focus, menu shutter, menu aperture. You must learn how to focus your lens manually because if you use a autofocus lens in total darkness, your autofocus lens cannot see anything. So your autofocus will not work in the dark. You must know how to use the menu focus function. I have uh, seen many photographers that don't know how to use menu focus and they were struggling in the dark. So if you want to go out and take pictures of the Milky Way, you better learn how to focus manually using your own lens. Okay. And, oh, sorry. And also set the shutter manually to 30 seconds, not one thirtieth of a second, but full 30 seconds, three zero seconds. And you can set your aperture to the widest aperture. Usually it's f4, f3.5, or even f2.8. Some of the super expensive lenses, they have aperture of f1.4, but they cost an arm and a leg. But anyway, one thing you should remember is the 500 rule. The 500 rule goes like this. You use 500 divided by the focal length to get your exposure time. So for example, if you are using a 16 millimeter lens, divide 500 by 16, then you got 31. Oh, I guess if you set it to 30 seconds, that would be a good exposure time. Why we use the 500 rules? Because if you don't use the 500 rules, if you expose your picture 
longer than what the 500 rule is telling you, your stars will move. Your stars will turn out not to be one dot in the sky. Your star will become a line. So remember the 500 rules. So I would recommend using ISO 6400 F2.8 and expose your picture for 30 seconds because I don't think you can set your camera to 31 seconds. Now, when you take pictures of the Milky Way or Aurora or anything in the dark, I would say, don't trust your eyes in the dark. I have seen many, many photographers. They took one picture of the Milky Way they got all excited. They said, wow, the Milky Way looks good. But when I look at the histogram, their, the histogram of their photo looks like this. To me, this is one grossly underexposed photograph. And when they try to adjust the photos in Photoshop, then they would have lots of digital noise in their photo. So do not trust your eyes when you take pictures of the Milky Way. Trust a histogram because the histogram will not lie to you. Now, when you finish taking picture of the Milky Way, if your picture histogram looks like this, you are still underexposing your picture. Now, if you don't know how to read the histogram, maybe you should go take some lessons in digital photography. The histogram is one of the most useful tool to any photographer. Every photographer trying to take a picture of the Milky Way must learn how to read and use the histogram. Now, here in the middle, it says neutral exposure. This is a good or well exposed photo. When you take a picture and when the histogram looks like this, we call it a normal bell shaped curve then this is a good exposed photo. Whereas this one up above, this is a underexposed picture. Why? Because we know that on the left is total darkness and on the right is total brightness. And when we take pictures, we expect to have a range of gray, going from very dark to neutral gray to lighter gray before it goes to total brightness. But in this histogram, we do not have very much information in the bright area. Remember, this center line is neutral gray, okay? So this photograph, is on the darker side because it is lower than neutral gray. And this photograph is grossly underexposed. It is no funny business. It, I would throw this picture out. But you sh your histogram should look like something like this. Now, when you take pictures of the Milky Way, if your histogram looks like this one, then I would congratulate you because you have captured every element that appear in the sky without underexposing and without overexposing. Now, a underexposed picture looks like this because we know that the 
this histogram continues on outside of this line, but it is truncated, meaning that the data in this area is lost, is truncated, is lost. But in this histogram, nothing is lost because we have darkest dark area here. And then we got all the neutral gray. We got lots of details in the bright area and nothing is truncated in the brightest bright. Whereas down here, the photo would be overexposed because we, we know that the curve continues on past the right hand edge and the information outside uh, to the right hand side of this line is forever lost. It is somewhere out here. So you don't want a picture like this. You want a picture like this. You want a picture like this. Uh, maybe this, this may be acceptable if, if you have a slow lens, but it is desirable to have your Milky Way picture looks like this on the histogram. It is better if your picture looks like this. All right. I think I've said enough about histogram. If you want to learn more about histograms, I can give you a two hour lecture on histogram. <laughs> when you want to take pictures of the Milky Way, you should know when to go. We should go when there is no clouds. It's no use going out on a cloudy night, right? That's common sense. We should go when there is no moon. Usually, four days before and four days after the new moon. So we have a window of eight days. If you are lucky, we may push it to five days before and five days after. So we have a window of 10 days every month to take pictures of the Milky Way. And you better pray that we have no clouds during those 10 days. Now, June is the best month because you can see the most beautiful part of the Milky Way. You should know where to go. We must go far from light pollution, away from the city or towns. You must be at least 40 kilometers if you are shooting away from the city. And you must be 80 kilometers if you are shooting towards the city. And you should always find beautiful landscape to complement the Milky Way, such as mountains, lakes, or trees. Now, jot this down, take notes. You must go to this website. The name of this website is called Dark sitefinder.com when you go to this website you will be able to find the, the entire globe but when you go to Canada you can easily find Calgary and Red Deer now here is a legend explaining about the color so basically Near the bottom is the worst. For example, within Calgary, in this gray area, you look up at the sky, you cannot see a thing. You cannot see any stars because it's so light polluted. If you go to the red zone, you may be able to see some stars because you are on the edge of the city. And then as you go further and further away, when you are in the green zone, you see lots of stars. But if you go to the dark gray area, such as this area, far from the city, like in here, to the far to the west in the mountains, you'll be able to see many, many stars that you don't usually see. And this darkest area are great for taking photos of the Milky Way. Look at this lake. Do any of you recognize this lake? 
This is Abraham Lake, and it is very dark. It is excellent for taking Milky Way photos. Okay, learn how to read the maps from this dark site finder. Now, another excellent website is called Clear Dark Sky. www.cleardarksky. When you go to this website, you enter the area you want to check. You can enter Red Deer or any small town in Alberta. And it will show you a chart like this. And this chart is uh, full of very useful information. So as you can see, it says Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So it, run, it shows you the 24-hour clock. And it shows many different kinds of information. Now, the first row here is cloud cover. Now. It, the the legend is down below. So if it is overcast with clouds, it will be light gray and then dark gray. And then if the sky is all clear, it will be dark blue. So this will tell you the amount of cloud cover. And then second row shows transparency of the sky, okay? If the sky is, is very transparent, it will be dark blue. Anything less than that, you get light blue. W what they mean by transparent is sometimes, even though you have no clouds, but you have humidity or lots of dust or lots of uh, smoke in the sky, then it will reduce the transparency. Now, the next one is seeing. What the hell is seeing? Now, as little kids, we all know the, the song, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Why do stars twinkle? It is because of the movement of the air in our atmosphere. So if the air becomes thick, then it blocks the light, making the light dim. But if the atmosphere is thin, if the uh, if the air in the in the well, if if the air in the atmosphere is very transparent, very clear, then the stars would appear brighter. So this is this affects the seeing. It is the movement of the air in the atmosphere that affects the seeing, uh, because when astronomers use a telescope to look at the, the stars, then the stars will change their brightness. And this change of brightness is called seeing. So when you have dark blue, that means seeing is very good. When you have light blue, that means seeing is not very good. And then the next one is darkness. When, when it is daytime, it is not dark, no good. But when it gets dark, it is almost black color. So it's very dark, so it's very good. And then down below, we have the wind, we have the humidity, we have the temperature. But the, it's the, the upper four rows, that's the most important. So please spend some time to learn how to read this clear sky chart and use it and check the sky before you go out, okay? Now, here is a picture taken 100 kilometers east of Calgary, looking west towards Calgary. It was taken on in December, in the winter time. So we can see Vega here, but we cannot, oh, well, we can see Altair as well. The core of the Milky Way is blocked by city lights right here. So you have to be 70 or 80 or 100 kilometers 
east of the city. If you want to shoot towards the city and get a view of the Milky Way. Now, this is Bolek in July. Now, Bolek is very dark, no light pollution. So the Milky Way shows up very well. Remember, Vega is here and Altair, the cowboy, is here. Now, when people see lines like this, they say, wow, you capture a meteor. Yes, this is a meteor. I was lucky when I exposed this photo for 30 seconds, a meteor streaked through the sky. However, this is not a meteor. This is a satellite. How can you tell the difference? The satellite is a man-made object and it does not emit light. It only reflects sunlight. When the meteor, uh, when, when the satellite reflects sunlight, it is uniform in its brightness. So you see a line of uniform thickness. So we know that it is a satellite. But when it comes to a meteor, a meteor always have pointed ends. So you can see on this end and on the other end, it becomes taper and it becomes very pointy. And the midsection is very bright because the meteor, when it enters our atmosphere, it, due to friction, it burns up. And at the beginning, only a little bit get burned, but later on, it gets burned very brightly and then it soon die out and there's no light. So a meteor would always have pointy ends at both ends and a center a bulge, a center part that is quite bright, okay? Whereas a uh, uh, satellite is a line of uniform thickness. Now this is the Columbia Ice Field in July. As you can see, in July, this part is the Milky Way core. It is big and full of features. You can make out the different clusters of stars in the Milky Way core. And again, Vega, Altair, and Dino. And this is the Columbia Ice Field. Okay. Now here is a picture taken by the best Milky Way expert in the world. I call him the best Milky Way expert because he took this photo in Hong Kong. We know that Hong Kong is the most light polluted city in the world. Bright lights everywhere you look. And yet this guy, he managed to take a picture of the Milky Way. And this is quite a big accomplishment. And I admire the guy. I read and I read the article about how he took this picture. And I learned a lot from him. His name is Vincent Zheng, C-H-E-N-G. Okay, and he is out of Hong Kong. And I learned a lot from him. Now, when you finish taking Milky Way pictures, you must know how to process your pictures in Photoshop. You must have Photoshop and know how to use it. If you don't have Photoshop, don't even talk to me, okay? Don't waste your time. It is great to have additional plugins such as Nick software. Nick is phenomenal. If you don't have it, buy it. It is well worth it. Now, what I mean by processing your photo in Photoshop, here is a photo of the Milky Way taken with 
a full moon in the sky. Now, with a full moon in the sky, I don't think you can see the Milky Way on this photo on the left hand side. But remember what I told you, the brightest star here is Vega. And then not too far away is Altair, the cowboy. Look at the cowboy's son and the cowboy's daughter behind. And the three of them line up. And there you go. Vega is right there. And here is Dunup. So I know exactly that the Milky Way runs down like this. So when I use Photoshop to process my photos, I know where to start. On the right hand side is the finished product. I process my Milky Way photo and the Milky Way is so prominent in this picture. Now remember on the left, you cannot even see the Milky Way in, in, in the, in, at the night of the full moon. But with Photoshop, I managed to salvage it and you can see the details of the Milky Way. Now look at the picture on the left. The picture on the left is Calgary. You probably recognize the Calgary Tower here. Okay, and you cannot see the Milky Way at all. When I took the picture, I cannot see the Milky Way. But remember our good friend, the Summer Triangle, Vega, Altair, and Dunu. So when I see these three stars, I know that the Milky Way goes across like this all the way down. And after some processing, I got my Milky Way over Calgary, and I'm proud of myself. Now here is a Milky Way photo taken in Iceland shortly after sunset. Here is Milky Way and the Aurora in Iceland at a waterfall. And again, know the star. Here is Vega, and here is Altair, okay? These stars are your best friend when you take pictures of the Milky Way. Now, how do you photograph the entire Milky Way? Now, tonight, oh, and when I took this picture, there's no moon, no clouds, no wind, perfect condition for Milky Way photo. So when we look at the Milky Way, one end of the Milky Way to the other end of the Milky Way, they are at opposite ends, meaning they are 180 degrees from each other. So when you are facing the core of the Milky Way, where is the edge of the Milky Way. The edge of the Milky Way will be right behind you at your back. So how do I take a picture like this? Okay, now I'll show you. Here is a set of photograph taken in a classroom. Okay, now I was using my fish islands, I took a picture facing the door, facing the front of the classroom. On this side, on the left, you can, you can still see the whiteboard, which is this whiteboard. And on this side, you can see the green board, which is the green board here. But on this side, this is 90 degrees from this front wall. So this is the wall on the left. And on this side, this is the wall on the right. Okay, now, what is this? 
Now, this is the wall on the right. But look at this. This is the wall on the back. If you are facing the front door, this is on your back, at the back of your head. And same here. This is the wall to the left, and this is the wall to the back. All right? So this is a set of seven photographs that I have taken using my fish eye lens in a vertical position. Okay, now I use software to stitch my photos together. Now, this is the resulting photo. So you can see the front wall. So this is the front, and this is the wall on the left. This is the wall on the right-hand side. Wait a minute. What is this? What is this? And what is this? This is the wall at the back when you are facing the front. So I have created a photo that is showing you the front, the left-hand side, the right-hand side, the sky above, and something behind. Now, this is the sky behind you when you bend over backwards, looking up. This is the wall at the back. So I have created one photo that shows the front, the top, the left-hand side, the right-hand side, and also the back of your picture. I don't think you can get any photograph that can show so much information. Okay, here is a photo taken in Canmore. Do any of you recognize these three mountains in this area? These mountains are called the Three Sisters, okay? And if you have seen the Three Sisters, then you know how wide angle this photo is. Remember, this is the front, and above it would be the sky directly above your head. So this is the sky above your head. What is this? This is the sky behind you. So if you bend over backwards, and when you arch backwards, you'll be able to see these stars on your back. What are these trees? These trees are already in your back, on the back side of you while, while you're standing there. So this is a phenomenal Y photograph showing the entire Milky Way. Now, I took this set of photos in a place called Sunny Nook. Does anybody know where Sunny Nook is? Sunny Nook is in the middle of nowhere, east of Drumheller, and it is extremely dark. You cannot find a better place to take photograph of the Milky Way. I went there. I went there in April. Okay, and you can see in April the Milky Way is very close to the horizon. Now, I found I found this abandoned house. And abandoned houses are best because it breaks the monotony of the horizon. And so when I took this picture, I saw the tree in the in the background. So I went over and I used this tree as my foreground. So you can see when you take pictures, you must include something from the landscape. Now, this photo was taken in Yaha Tinder Ranch. Oh, I'm sorry. It's uh, 2022, not 2023. I made a mistake in my typo. Yaha Tinder is straight west of Oz. 
when you go to the dark side finder, you realize that your yeah, Tinder is very dark. And I was lucky when I was taking photos of the Milky Way in April, we got beautiful Aurora. And I got my friend post for me and I got this beautiful photo. And on, on the right hand side, this is the core of the Milky Way. Okay, so but you have to realize that from where this lady was sitting to the Milky Way core, we are looking at 180 degrees. So if I am facing this lady, the Milky Way core is behind my back. So that's what happened when I take pictures. Okay, now this is the Milky Way core and I use a 28 millimeter lens to take this picture. But when you look at the Milky Way core, you see all kinds of detail and you can see the clouds of dust that forms interesting pattern. So you don't necessarily have to take a picture of the complete Milky Way. If you can get part of the Milky Way, you can make an interesting photo out of it. Now, this was taken near the town of Hannah. Okay, and you can see this line going like this. I believe that's the International Space Station flying <clears throat> across the sky. Now, here's a beautiful abandoned house. Now, I love abandoned house. And if anyone in the audience, if you know of any good abandoned house in your area, please, please let me know. I love to take photos of the Milky Way or the Aurora with abandoned houses. Now, shortly after this photo was taken, you can see the clouds moving in from the left, okay? So shortly after this picture was taken, the clouds came in. It turned out cloudy, but I would not give up. I asked my friend, to change to different clothing and I managed to take this picture with my light painting equipment. So I was waving my light wand in the background and I made the best out of the situation. So when you go out and take pictures of the Milky Way, if clouds come in, think about light painting. Now, I love the town of Murnam. I don't know if you have been there or not, but the town has a very attractive little church. And then right beside it is a scale model. This scale model is uh, about my height. So it's very small, but it makes beautiful pictures. But anyway, I did not take Milky Way pictures right at this church because this church is located too close to town with too much light pollution. But I went not too far from Murnam and I found this little church and I got my Milky Way photo. And remember, in May and June, we are able to see the Milky Way core. So I got a beautiful Milky Way photo. And fortunately, I also got some Aurora as well. So there are numerous opportunities every month for us to take photos of the Milky Way. Now, these pictures were taken at Kananaskis in June. Remember, June is the best time because we get to see the most beautiful part of the Milky Way, the core. So this is the core of the Milky Way. And then when I'm tired of taking pictures of the Milky Way, I do 
light painting under the Milky Way. And I got lots. I, I spent the whole night doing all kinds of fun stuff under the Milky Way. Now, here is another Milky Way picture of Calgary taken just recently. And on the left is before, and on the right is after the processing. So, and I am proud of my pictures. I don't think too many people know how to take Milky Way pictures in a heavily light polluted city. It took me a lot of trial and error and a lot of learning from the experts, but I got it. Now, this is Vermilion Lakes in Banff, taken in 2021. Now, a picture like this is extremely difficult to take. If you don't believe me, next time when you go out to take pictures of the Milky Way, try to capture the reflection of the Milky Way. It is many, many times more difficult than you could imagine. Now, I try to take pictures of the same Milky Way in Banff. However, look underneath the water. I got too many weeds growing underwater and the weeds, they were bright color. So they interfere with the reflection of the Milky Way. Now, out here, when I don't see the, the reeds, I can see good reflection of the Milky Way. But as I move out here, I can still see a little bit of the Milky Way, but the, ref but the, the reeds from under the water kind of got into the way. Now, what is this bright reflection here? When we look up at the sky, that is Vega the brightest star in the summer sky. And here is the reflection. So I have a lot of fun taking on challenges and taking all kinds of photographs of the Milky Way. And I hope you will go out and take pictures of the Milky Way and have fun. Come join us on Friday. Now, do Anyone in the audience have any questions for me? Um, I'll I'll relay the questions. Uh, give me a moment, please. Uh, for those of you that are taking pictures, I believe the uh, video will be made available on the uh, club website on our YouTube channel. Um, so yeah, any questions? You were first. Um, Tony, could you address for everybody how to focus in the dark on the stars? Did you hear that, Tony? Uh, Carmen asked, uh, how no. do you focus in the dark? Okay. Now, there are several ways to focus in the dark. The easiest is to find the brightest star in the sky, meaning you aim your camera towards the star Vega, which will be the brightest star in the sky. And then manually, you, you, you enlarge your picture area and turn your focusing ring until the star becomes a very sharp and pointy dot on your uh, camera's monitor. Now, another way is to find a friend to help you because in the dark, it's hard to focus. But if you can ask your friend to walk 30 steps or 50 steps away from you and then turn around and point the flashlight or the headlamp towards you, you will be able to focus on your friend's headlamp manually. When you got it into focus and then you can re-aim your camera at the sky and you take one test shot once you expose your first photo, then you review your picture and enlarge your picture to test and see if your stars are all sharp and in focus. 
Thank you, Tony. Next question. You're welcome. Uh, the question is, what was the focal length of the uh, Roly Carl Zeiss lens that you pointed out earlier? Um, my Carl Zeiss lens is 16 millimeter fish eye. And uh, if you Google search it on um, uh, eBay, you you can often find a handful uh, for sale. Okay. Any other questions? I believe it's two point eight. Was it a two point eight? Yes, it is a two point eight, and it works wonders. Yes. So Tony, when you're um, taking a photo, um, and you're not you're not moving your tripod ever, right? You're just uh, moving the head uh, around you. Is that correct? Uh, so, yes, uh, I believe the. Is, I believe the question seven is photos. The the question was yes, when you're I, using. I, the question was when you're using your tripod. Uh, for the panoramas, do you move the tri tripod? You just move the head, right? Uh, that's correct. I just use the head. And um, I'm so used to it, I can change from one position to, a, to another extremely quickly. So that even when I take pictures of the aurora, you know, aurora are constantly moving. I work so fast that I have capture many aurora photos and stitch them together successfully before the aurora moves away. So um, you should get very familiar with your equipment, know your routine, and know how to rotate the head of your uh, tripod head so that you can continue to take pictures relatively quickly. Okay, another question. So do you um how how far do you overlap your uh, photos when you're doing that? Uh, do you do it like a fifty percent overlap? That is a very good question. Um, I often aim for thirty to forty percent overlap. Now, I try to do lots of overlap more than fifty percent. I find that to be counterproductive because when you are using software to stitch them, if you overlap too much, the software may do funny things. So if you do 30% overlap, uh, that's the way the software, the, the, the sweet spot for the software to stitch them together. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yes. What software do you use to stitch? What do you use to stitch a software? Okay. Now, I have been using a, a software that is called PTGUI. It's a funny name, and I think other people call it PTGUI. So PTGUI. <laughs> and uh, I think you pay maybe $200 for it. I've been using it for over 10 years and I have upgraded many times and it is far more superior than Photoshop, especially when it comes to fish eye photos. When you try to stitch them in Photoshop, Photoshop will, will just give you a text message saying that it cannot be done. But PT GUI, can stitch your photos extremely well. So if you are serious, uh, go buy a fish island and go buy this PTGUI software. Is that available on uh, Mac and Windows? Uh, yes. Okay. okay, thank you. Next question. Going once, going twice. Are you saving them all up for Friday night? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Tony, thank you very much.
it's very informative, entertaining as usual. And uh, we're looking so much to uh, seeing you on Friday night. I would, I would like to add, um, if anyone is going out to take pictures on Friday, I would highly recommend that each and every one of you get familiar with your camera and your lens. Make sure you know how to set everything manually. I have seen many friends who struggle when we go out together and I just don't have the patience because the camera is, is yours. You should know how to use it. I don't know how to use Nikon cameras. So um, don't come to me and say, Tony, how do you, how do you focus uh, a Nikon camera and lens? I don't know how to do it. So I don't want anyone raise that kind of questions on Friday night, but um, spend time with your camera and know your camera. Make sure you know how to mount your camera on your tripod in total darkness. Because if, if there were 10 of us or 20 of us taking pictures together, if you cannot mount the camera on your tripod, and if you turn on the headlamp, you ruin it for everybody. Because with one person turning on the light, no one can take pictures. So this is very important and very serious. You must know your camera. You must, well, maybe when we first get to a location, we will give everyone five minutes to set up. And once the five minutes is set up, no one should be allowed to turn on the headlight, the headlamp, because it would really ruin everyone's pictures. Uh, sorry, Tony, what uh, brand of camera do you use? I use Sony. So if uh, anyone is using Sony, I I'm quite confident I can show you how Sony cameras work. Okay, everybody rush over to Hank. He's got a whole bunch to sell. <laughs> oh, but you've got some at uh, McBain's, don't you? Okay. Any other questions? Okay, yes. If you don't have a headlamp, is the flashlight If you don't have a headlamp, is the flashlight okay? Uh, yeah, but I would say a cell phone would be okay. Today, many of the cell phones would have a built-in flashlight, and they are not super strong. So uh, there's less chance of ruining things for everyone. And also, uh, for those that have headlamps, if you turn it on to red or green, it's less disruptive to your night vision than white light is. So, But it still ruins the picture. Yeah. It does, indeed, yes. But, now, I have but to, while we're, while, I have while we're to, setting up, uh, while we're setting up, you want to get your eyes acclimatized to, to the light, so try to use red if you can. Otherwise, you're going to be trying to adjust from a bright white light, and it's just going to take you that much longer. But yes, right. and also, also, when people turn on the red light, they, they believe the red light does not affect photography, which is all wrong. Even when you turn on the red light, when you are facing away from the camera, the, 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 the photo would show the red light because we are using ISO 6400, which is extremely sensitive to light. So even when, when other people are taking pictures, if you turn on the red light, it would still ruin everyone's picture. Okay, thank you for that. Other questions? No? Yes? All right, that's to I think that's a wrap, Tony. Thank you again very much. And uh, may, I, may I ask what time are we meeting at uh, Dry Island Buffalo Jump? All right, we'll see you there. What time? Oh, what time? oh nine o'clock, but uh, we'll be in touch by email after tonight, Tony. Okay, I will see you at nine o'clock there. All right then. Good night okay, and safe travels. Good night, travels. everyone. Bye-bye. Great. Thank you.